How 1588 PTP Works, a presentation by Calnex Solutions. 1588 version 2, or PTP, the Precision Timing Protocol, is an Ethernet-based protocol that allows timing to be transported across a packet network. We're going to show you how this works in a real network and a real application. Looking at a representation of a network, the idea of the Precision Timing Protocol is to give the network the ability to transport timing information from the core of a network or the edge of a network right through to multiple points at the edge or access of the network. Precision Timing Protocol is a protocol that takes timing from a Grand Master, a 1588 version 2 Grand Master, and takes that time information and distributes it in terms of pack time stamped packets across a network. Why do you want to do this? This is done really to align clocks all over a network with a master clock to allow synchronization to be spread across the network. Now, this is required for a number of different applications, for example, mobile phone networks, financial trading networks, as well as power communication networks, who all need to be referenced to a time reference to work correctly. 1588 version 2 PTP gives you the ability to transport timing from one point of the network to another using Ethernet or IP packets. This is done really, if you think about it conceptually, uh, by way of each of these elements having their own clocks and everybody is adjusting or synchronizing the, their clocks to the master clock. Think about it as the master clock having a time or a watch showing the time and each of these elements have a watch themselves and all of these watches are adjusted to the same time as the master. That's in theory the concept that's happening with 1588. When everybody has adjusted their own clocks or watches to the same time, everybody is synchronized. So how does 1588 version 2 work? Well it works by the master or the grand master having the reference time and all of the other devices called slaves locking their own time to the masters. So let's see how what happens when a master and a slave meet up. A slave clock initiates a session startup with the master, and this is just a protocol handshaking process that tells the master the slave is there and it wants the master's time. The process of the master transferring the time to the slave is then by, done by a series of exchange of messages. Now by exchanging these messages, some of which contain timestamps, the slave is able to adjust its own clock to the clock of the master. How does this happen in, in uh, practice? Well, let's illustrate this with an example. Now, this process here shows the master sending a timestamp packet or a packet with a timestamp in it called the sync message to the slave. Once this arrives at the slave, the slave sends an acknowledgement back to the master or a delay request message, which is then acknowledged by way of a delay response message. So these three messages, namely sync, delay request, and delay response, carrying some of them timestamps, at the end of that interaction, the slave actually has the following data. T1 from the master, T2, which is its own timestamp, T3, which is its own time, and T4, which is come back timestamp of a master. When it has all of this information, the slave can then calculate the effective round trip delay and then eliminate half of that delay, or rather calculate the one-way delay by dividing the round-trip delay by two, and then working out what is the delay between the master and the slave. By knowing the time T1 and the delay that it took for T1 to reach um, the slave, the slave can then calculate its own clock. The slave adjusts its clock to be the same as the master, and it does this by looking at the master's time and working out the delay in the network. So that's how the slave clocks in the network adjust their own clocks to synchronize with the master clock. So once again, in a real network, the master sits towards the core of the network, referenced to some time reference, for example, by GPS, and then it sends packets through the network onto the slave, which then aligns its um, clock with that of the master, and that's how the network is synchronized. So what's the problem here? Seems a reasonably straightforward concept. Well, let's look at it in a network. What happens in an Ethernet or IP network is that you get accumulation of delay and delay variation. In a network where you only have a master and a slave, you have a, a collection of switches or routers in between. What happens with routers is that they queue 
packets in buffers, and that leads to a variation in the delay that the packet takes through the network. Remember, the slave is working out the delay across the network and adjusting its time using that delay information. What happens when that delay keeps changing? Well, when that delay keeps changing, that instantly becomes a problem to the slave. While it's doing all of its calculation, packet delay variation means that that delay isn't just calculated once, it has to constantly be calculated and the slave clock has to be corrected. In other words, packet delay variation is the main challenge that the slave clock faces in recovering accurate time. So we can see here, if we go to the previous slide, we'll see that packet delay when accumulated in the network means the slave clock has a problem. Slave clock has a challenge to recover accurate time when there's a great delay of packet delay variation and asymmetry in the network. So, when you just have a master and a slave clock in a network of ordinary routers, uh, recovery of time can be a challenge. So, what, is, what can be done to address the problem of packet delay variation? Well, the, the standards bodies have defined two types of devices which help alleviate the problem of packet delay variation. The first of these is a boundary clock. A boundary clock is, in effect, a back-to-back -back slave and a master. It terminates the 1588 uh, packet flow recovers the timing and then timestamps and acts as a master for the next node. Well, how does this help in terms of alleviating PDB? If you think about it, if you have a network of all boundary clocks or VCs, the boundary clock will recover and regenerate the time. So the contribution of packet delay variation is simply from one node and one link, which is a lot less than the accumulated packet delay variation of multiple nodes. In other words, boundary clocks reduce the amount of packet delay variation that a 1588 packet experiences through the network. Less PDB, less asymmetry means it's easier for the slave to recover a more accurate clock. So boundary clocks help the slave to recover uh, more accurate timing information. The other type of device that's also been defined is called a transparent clock. A transparent clock is simply a device that measures a packet delay through itself by timestamping the packet of the ingress and the egress of the device. Once it measures this delay, it reports or inserts this delay into a field called the correction field in the 1588 packet. The correction field carries the value of the delay of this particular device. In a network of transparent clocks, every transparent clock will do the same. In other words, the first transparent clock will write its own delay into the correction field. The second one will add its delay into the correction field. So there will be a cumulative value in this correction field equivalent to or close to the packet delay variation or the delay accumulation through that network. Remember, if the slave has pack is receiving packets that have experienced significant packet delay variation, but it can look at this packet and, and actually get that delay value, it can effectively correct, hence the name correction field. It can correct for the delay variation simply by reading the correction field values entered by the transparent clocks. So transparent clocks work quite differently to boundary clocks. Boundary clocks work by recovering and regenerating the, the packet, so uh, thereby reducing packet delay variation. Transparent clocks work by reporting their delay to the slave and allowing the slave to correct for that delay and delay variation. Now, boundary clocks, ordinary clocks, and transparent clocks are all specified under different ITUT standards. This diagram represents a collection of ITUT recommendations and standards that are being developed or already been ratified to look at the performance and the use of slave clocks, boundary clocks, and transparent clocks in networks. These standards also include the methodology for testing the performance of slave clocks, boundary clocks, and transparent clocks. More information on testing slave clocks, boundary clocks, and transparent clocks can be found at the Calnex website, calnexol.com. A quick summary of what we've discussed today. 1588 PTP, or the Precision Timing Protocol, allows timing to be transported across the network using packets. The slave clocks adjust their clocks to the master's clocks and synchronize using the 1588 mechanism. 
Packet delay variation or the variation of delay through a network is a significant issue, a challenge for the slaves to recover time accurately. So devices called boundary clocks and transparent clocks were devised to help alleviate the issue of PDB. Boundary clocks fundamentally recover and regenerate the signal, thereby reducing the PDB accumulation in the network. Transparent clocks report their own delay to the slave, allowing the slave to correct for delay and delay variation. ITUT has specified a bunch of standards to look at the performance and the deployment of these, and the also, which also includes the performance testing requirements. And these testing requirements are covered in a separate video from Calnex called How to Test 1588 Version 2. Thank you for your time.